Hello, AWS reInvent. Uh, my name is Gerard Bartolome, and I am the principal data platform engineer for Sweetgreen. Um, we are a fast casual farm to table um, food chain that specializes on sustainability and simplicity within healthy food. Um, today, I'll be talking about how Sweetgreen lives within our data lake, uh, specifically our object store in AWS, um, Amazon S3. So we believe as a food company, a sustainable food company, whatever you put in your body basically has a direct impact within the community, within the individual, and also within the environment. These five pillars that you see on the screen basically enables our food ethos to serve the highest quality food possible. So within our data ecosystem, what we have um, we have, since we are a food and beverage company, we have quite a bit of unconventional data that doesn't necessarily align to the digital side of things. Um, we have 31 plus data sources that live within our ecosystem back and forth, interacting with our object store and our services um, that align more on the FNB sector. Um, that can be farm data within weather, soil, or health of a vegetable. That can be um, a wholesale distributor all the way to our POS, to our CRM, to our chatbots, to our clickstream user behavior within our iOS, Android, and web platforms. Um, we still follow the same ETL, ELT principles of um, kind of pipeline processing, but more catered to the data lake. And since our data, um, our tier one data, is basically as raw as it can be, immutable, um, what we do, instead of the T for transformation, we call it translation. So we're not technically transforming this immutable bra object. What we're really doing is we're translating it and representing it in a different state to go into a Redshift cluster, to go into Aurora, to go into document, uh, to a document store like DynamoDB. Um, we are somewhat of a polyglot team. Um, my mantra has always been, don't adapt the language to the data. Um, data processing, especially if you're a downstream consumer, um, there's no one and one all end all solution. Um, so we try to basically have open source solutions within the distributed framework, uh, within computation and languages like Java, Scala, and Golang, um, which we use quite a bit to do a lot of this processing within multi-processing environments. Um, Within those things, the way we process is basically we have all these different data structures from unstructured protocol buffers, JSON to database result sets. Um, we want to be able to be autonomous and adaptable. And that's kind of the theme that I'll be talking about. Um, the way our data is, since we are downstream consumers, we build our own native applications homegrown. So we're able to adapt as fast as we can as, as fast as the data grows and also as fast as the data changes. Because all you all here have had problems having changes on, on an upstream level and then seeing it downstream and having be able to, to adapt that code base. Um, before we get to the, the translation and the load process, um, the way we think of security and the way we handle security is within the basic IAM roles. Um, we are the stewards of our data. So we take security and privacy to, we're pretty vigilant about it. Um, so the way we do it, and user is synonymous to basically a, a service, an application, or a human. So within our users, um, we basically have the IAM role aspect of things. Once you've logged in with an, with an MFA, you're assigned an IAM role. So within that IAM role, it's basically a gateway sort of policy within our, our ecosystem. Once you get in, you're basically assigned into an IAM group. So that IAM group basically has specific ACLs that are tied to it, specifically for our verticals. So now our verticals, since we are a multi-dimensional team, our IAM groups range from both ML, data science, BI, to infrastructure. All those different verticals have their own specific IAM groups within IAM policies that specifically can only access different services within their domain. Um, we also have another one where if you are a user and you want to directly go into our, our, pri our private subnet domains within a, a private util box or an EMR cluster to do Spark Shell to be able to do discovery, we give, the ac we give access to the user to be able to SSH via their own key pair um, to get into th these machines. Now that's handled by our Bastion host. So our Bastion proxy basically is the gateway from our 
public domains to our private subnets, where all our core services live. So now that we kind of got security on hand, um, this is how our transformation or translation services kind of work. We have several core services that we use to be able to transform data. Um, a lot of that, like I said, lives within our private subnets. Um, nothing can come in and out of our data lake that's public. So our data lake is basically all private. We don't expose anything to the public. All our objects are private. Um, it's also tagged with standard AES 256 encryption, which is the AWS standard. Um, so that interacts with our private services. Um, a lot of our private services, since we've created these native applications, live in containers. So we're able to deploy these containers a lot faster when things need to be iterated. Um, we use AWS ECS Fargate to handle a lot of the managed aspect of the resources. Um, same thing, you know, we build it within Terraform and then we, we deploy it into ECS. Um, we also have Lambda invocations. So now these Lambda invocations are all within the private subnets. Um, the way it's able to talk to our public is basically within which is our vendor integrations, our webhooks, our Kinesis stream applications within API gateway, um, is within common um, data in transit security practices. Now that could be from HTTPS to TLS, also to AWS v4 signature authentication. But to have that extra layer also, we use a lot of AWS's uh, secure token service, which allows a temporary token to be basically instantiated when you're doing a get call or a put call within our object store. Um, another core service that we do use and that we love um, is Amazon EMR, uh, specifically um, Amazon Spark 2.4. Uh, um, no, no, Amazon, sorry, Spark 2.4. Um, so same kind of patterns, we have an act gateway that basically controls our egress out, nothing gets in. Um, basically we use Spark to be able to, to do a lot of things, basically do Spark streaming within Kinesis or Kafka, um, munge data up from API calls, or basically trying to represent um, the data within our object store into formats where we can put it in as like, say, ORC format within a Presto backend to be able to enable our self-service tools. Um, you can see within the processing layer, all those are basically triggered um, within a, a scheduler or a task aspect of things. Um, we are quite open source, so we use Airflow to, to do that. Um, so th this processing layer basically handles all the Spark submits, our step functions within EMR clusters to be able to interact both within the data lake and out of the data lake. Um, so how do we use this data? Um, so, we have two classifications of S3 buckets. We have S3 standard. Um, we are not technically a big data company yet. I mean, we're still somewhat of a startup, so we only have you know, 100 some terabytes within our data lake. Um, so we still consider a lot of things hot. So within that, we have S3 standard, and we use that quite a bit since the way we think about our services is everything is ephemeral. So basically, all our services could die. Everything still lives within the object store. So we have the ability to, to always have hot data to put into a document store or to put into an MPP or to put into something that's malleable to a different service. Um, IA, which is our infrequent usage, is basically more lookup. So anything that is a key value lookup or anything that doesn't necessarily change a lot that can be persisted into like a database um, that doesn't necessarily have to be accessed um, quite a bit, we put that into an S3 IA bucket. Um, so that segues to how we basically use this data. So we use this data in same kind of fashion. We have private data and then public data. So then private data, that's what our fleet uses because we have 100 and plus one stores that basically use our insights. We have Tableau basically to report and analyze data with it insights within our corporate. Um, we have self-service. So that self-service, as I mentioned earlier, is a Presto backend EMR cluster that runs Apache Zeppelin, which is a notebooking um, feature, and also uh, Hadoop U, which is a, UI, a SQL UI. Um, so that's all basically munched up using Amazon Redshift. So our MPP consolidates all this data within our object store and basically creates a, a core data warehouse structure so we're able to output this into Tableau reports and to output this into a kind of a data warehouse structure within our, our self-service tools. From a public subnet, uh, I talked about basically our integrations with webhooks and endpoints within our vendors, um, and also with also streaming. Um, 
We also have this thing called Sweet Green OS. It's basically a suite of OS tools that's data-driven to be able to help our operational aspect of our 100 plus stores. Um, a great example of that is we have a data-driven algorithm that basically predicts how much food we should cook per day, per time period in increments. Um, the reason why that's so important for us is because we want to be able to be sustainable and also be cognizant about food waste. Plus, we also want to have the integrity of food fresh so our customers know that we're basically presenting the best food possible. Lastly, and I'll talk a little bit about this briefly, um, we are a California company, so we are going to be, we're going to have to be compliant with a law coming up in California, which is called CCPA, or California Consumer Privacy Act, that basically has to ensure our data lake is fully anonymized. Um, so what we do and what we have is we basically have an anonymizer application that's backed by EMR Spark. And what it does is it basically takes any type of format or structure. You can put binary data in there, you can put result sets from a database, you can put um, basically dynamic JSON. What it does is it takes all those different aspects of structures, um, passes it through a regex pattern um, algorithm and also um, indexes within our data catalog. And based off of what it finds, um, we're able to mask all this data out and then assign it a global unique identifier from our document store, which is our, our ID service, um, our private ID service, before it gets to the data lake. So once it gets to our production data lake, everything is already anonymized and we reference everything within a global identifier that lives within our, our secure document store. Um, that was a little kind of synopsis. Um, if you all want to hear more about this, um, I'm here for a week for the whole conference and these are the things that, uh, this is a pretty important thing, especially for California. If you all want a, a more deep dive, please just tap me and I'll be happy to, to, you know, to kind of go step by step on how we basically anonymize data within Sweetgreen. Um, lastly, uh, this is a plug for us. We're, we're only as good as our talent pool. So if you are interested in, you know, in a dynamic kind of company where it's, everything is somewhat still unconventional and you're, you're able to grow in a, in a blank canvas, um, we're hiring on the engineering, both on the data and the back end and front end side. Um, thank you, and I'll hand it over to John.